name is Steve Holmes, and I have the privilege to serve the staff of Spring Free Trampoline as their chief bouncing officer. <laughs> now, you can't have that title and not have a little bit of fun. And, um, and this is part of having fun, even though our conversation tonight will be of a very serious nature. And that is we jump into conversations with people who have expertise in a field, who are inspirational, motivational, educational, and enable us as individuals within our company who are joining us today on Zoom, and maybe you're joining us from outside on Facebook Live, welcome. Our opportunity today is to listen and to learn, and I hope I won't get in the way. Our guest tonight is just a terrific guy, and he is the Chief Medical Director uh, and Founding and Current Medical Director of Preventative Medicine and Integrated Health at Deerfields Clinic. He is the Virgin Galactica Aerospace medical examiner. He is a well-learned mindfulness and meditation instructor, cogn cognitive behavioral psychotherapist. <laughs> I'm fortunate enough to say maybe he's my doctor and a friend. Welcome to Jumping Into Conversation, Dr. Randy Kinnick. So first of all, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I'm really happy to spend this time with you and also with uh, you know your colleagues, and I get that there are people tuning in from all over the world that are interested in this topic, and I'm just delighted to be here with you, uh, Stephen. Yeah, now, Randy, we like to have a little bit of fun to get started, even though our subject matter tonight is is less that you know it's it's something we're going to learn from. But our customers are are really our kids and uh, and parents of kids. Um, and so let's jump back. Tell us a little bit about Randy Knipping, um, the 10 year old boy. Well, when I was 10 years old, uh, I was living in Calgary. And I would say that my best memories was uh, freezing half to death outside playing ice hockey. Um, we had six ice rinks uh, literally in our backyard. And as soon as they were open, four of them had boards and two of them were just for recreational uh, skating. And I remember being there until the bitter end of every weekday night and on the weekends. And I remember coming home with my fingers and toes so frozen when, when I came in, they were numb and I would have to put them over a hot, a hot air register and endure this agonizing pain as my fingers and thaws came back to life. But <laughs> my memory of that, it was, it was so much fun and I had so much enjoyment out of it. Um, that was sort of a, a highlight of when I was 10 years old. Amazing. Now, we can't go through your whole CV, but jump ahead now. Your, your, your approach to medicine, Randy, just share for, for our staff, what is that approach to medicine and, and how did it form for you? Yeah. So I actually, uh, before I went to medical school, uh, I was a cell biologist and published a couple of original papers in neuroendocrinology, which is brain hormone chemistry. So when I got to medical school, my first thought was that I would end up as a doctor researcher. But actually in medical school, I got very interested in preventive medicine. And the reason for that is that most patients that you see in the hospital when they come in with an acute illness or an exacerbation of a chronic illness, at some point in the past, they had preventable disease. So 80% of all the disease we see is preventable. And I was really surprised at how little training and how little support we were getting in preventable disease. And the, and the key sort of realization for me was stress. If you think about it carefully, you know, what's the, what's the, the most common cause of lung cancer? Well, smoking. But what causes smoking? Well, stress. So behavioral medicine, which is a subset of psychology, is all about the difference between knowing something and actually doing something. And when it comes to stress, um, people resort to all kinds of behaviors, alcohol and drugs and overeating and obsessing with things. And people really don't know what stress is and how to master stress. And so that really was what got me started on this journey of, of preventive medicine. 
Now, so if you think about it now, I, I don't know when you think of preventative medicine and is it and the way you describe it in integrated health is there's is that like a functional sense of medicine? I mean, is stress definable in that way? Yeah, I mean, if you if you think about it from the point of view of a neuroscientist, um, you know, when the human ancestral mind is agitated, confused, and disturbed, which is sort of the the starting point of this cascade of stress. This is even before the fight or flight response. It's a mental state. At that point in time, our mind and our body goes through a process essentially to prepare us for whatever is going on in our environment outside our mind. So it captures our attention. We see that there's a threat. We see that there's some kind of loss of control or loss of security. And our mind begins thinking, thinking, thinking. Our body begins, you know, spooling up adrenaline and so on and so forth. And for most people, it's a very, very unpleasant part of their existence. So we look for relief. The problem is we think that the source of the stress is actually outside of our mind. So our focus is on what we think is triggering the stress. So but actually... So the whole cascade is inside our mind and inside our body. So is stress the cause of the problem or the result of it? Well, I think stress is the response of our ancestral mind and body to a real or imaginary threat, whether it's a boundary violation, a broken agreement, an unmet expectation, any change in our environment that poses a potential threat creates the basis of stress. And, and this is something that's universal. Everyone experiences it to a greater or to a lesser extent. Well, if you think about what we're going through now, certainly mental health is at the top of, of, of so much, but, but independent of some of the things that are health, happening within society, we've also got political issues. We've got all of these things that our mind kind of jumps ahead and it does create this cascading effect. I mean, what, what is your thought there? You know, I was asked a few years ago to see a patient at a hospice. I worked at a hospice for a number of years, a place where people go basically to die in a secure and a safe and a, and a pleasant environment, even though these people all have cancer. And I was asked by one of the nurses to see a patient who is very near death and who basically wanted to learn how to meditate. And I was even shocked. And I thought, you know, here's somebody who's probably not going to be alive in a few days. And I thought, well, what is the one thing that I could do that actually would relieve her stress? And so I went in there and I asked her what she wanted. And I taught her a very simple exercise called conscious breathing. Hopefully, when we have some time, we'll go into that at the end of the session. I'll take you through it. And it was very interesting because what she said to me afterwards stuck with me. And she says, you know, even though I'm dying and you're not, we are both completely alive right now in this moment. It's only because I know that I'm going to be dying in a few days that makes us any different. But this present moment that we shared is the same. And it's wonderful. And that was the only meditation that she actually had done in her life before or since. And of course, a couple of days later, she passed away. Now, you, your history or, or getting to, to this place of, of mindfulness or meditation therapy, it, it, it's not recent. No. No, I was, I was kind of an oddball even since I was a kid. And shortly after uh, we came to Toronto, um, in grade seven, I was 12 years old, so this is 1971. Um, my, uh, my grade seven history teacher, Ms. Harris, introduced me to a Chinese history book. And in it, uh, there was a story about a monk who was going to a village to buy provisions for the monastery. And on the way, he was attacked by some bandits and somebody cut off his hand. And I remember very clearly in the book, it said that although this monk was experiencing pain, he didn't suffer. And I thought, 
Well, how did he manage that? Because as far as I know, somebody cuts off my hand, that would be horrible. And I was going through some real difficulties at the time. So I asked her, I said, what was it that he was doing? And she showed me a picture of this monk in the back who was meditating, he had his hands like this. There was a candle and, and the instructions were that he was simply following his breath. And what do you do when you're, when, you're, when you're 12 years old? You pretend. So I went home, I went into my closet, turned on a candle, I'm surprised I didn't burn the place down. And I pretended to meditate by following the breath. Well, what happened was it worked. So I started practicing. Whenever I was stressed out about something or upset, I practiced in the closet. And I'm embarrassed to say that at the time, I thought that nobody in the world is doing this because this is a history book. And of course, everything in history is in the past. Nobody does this anymore. And it wasn't until many years later, I went to university to McMaster and I came across a couple of meditation grad students and they told me, ah, well, we were still meditating and they taught me and I learned. Um, and so to me, it was wonderful that this practice still had a living presence. So I, I ended up spending 10 years training with two Tibetan masters, Geshe Kelsen Gyatso and Geshe Kelsen Tarchin. Tarchin was an, an American draft dodger. He was a psychologist from the States, Dr. Charles Rodemore. And he came to Toronto to start a center. So I trained with them for 10 years. And then I spent two years training at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health here in Toronto. It used to be called the Clark Institute of Psychology or Psychiatry and the Addiction Research Foundation. And I trained under Dr. Uh, Zindel Segal and Dr. Mark Lau. Zindel Segal is the principal author of uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for depression, and, you know, well known all over the world. So this is sort of how it began and then how it evolved. And now uh, mindfulness is an integral part of how I work with all of my clients and executives. Why? Because stress is such a fundamental driver of the lifestyle behaviors that lead to a lot of the health problems that I see. Now, I remember when we first met and you said to me, talk to me about your stress. And I said, no, 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 I, I, I don't have any stress. I sleep well, you know, da, da, da. which is, of course, not true. But, you know, when we think of what's happening out there today, we are all experiencing stress. Yeah. And, and we're hearing about it. So how, how is it that the body reacts? I mean, we all must do it differently. But talk to us a little bit about the, how the body reacts to it. So I, I remember a client many years ago who, not unlike yourself, claimed that he wasn't experiencing <laughs> stress. So I said, okay, that's fine. So what I did is I hooked him up to a device that measures your heart rate variability. So this is a very precise way of measuring the activity of your sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system is the driving force behind the, the, you know, the fight or flight response. So I hooked him up to this machine. And of course, this is what his heart rate variability looked like, which is typical of sympathetic overdrive. And he was no longer aware of this, not because he wasn't experiencing stress, but he had adapted to it and he had suppressed the sensations that were associated with stress. So he didn't think they existed anymore. And then what I did is I taught him a simple exercise called conscious breathing, and we focused on gratitude. And what happened is after about three or four minutes, instead of his heart doing this, his heart rate variability completely stabilized and produced this sine wave where his heart rate was now coherent. And I asked him, how are you feeling? And he says, wow, I feel great. What did you do? And I said, I didn't do anything. All you did is you started meditating, started focusing on the breath. He says, I haven't felt like this in years. He says, that's because you're, you're, you're so used to stress. You don't know what it feels like anymore to be completely calm and clear and stable. And your body is resonating with that. And, and he completely changed his approach to stress and began meditating. Not very long, five, 10 minutes a day. And of course, you know, that's, 
that is sort of a typical example of what I see when I see somebody who claims not to be stressed out. We all are. I mean, I mean today I read three different articles um, about circumstances. None of them used the word stress. The first was that alcohol consumption is at a 40 year high. And wow. interestingly enough, of course, bars and restaurants are closed. So it's all, <laughs> all being consumed at home. Number two is there's this new phrase called COVID divorce. Uh, and the third thing, which is, you know, Simon Sinek has been talking about this past week, as well as Adam Grant, two podcasters in the business world, that the number one issue facing the workplace is loneliness. Right. Now, none of those people used stress. Mm -hmm. Are those stress? Well, I think clearly that either stress is implied or it should be in, imputed onto those three descriptions because they all come from a final common denominator. You and me and everyone you know, we are born with an ancestral mind, which we inherited not from our parents, but from all of our ancestors. So what that means is that all of the attitude, values, beliefs, behavior, all of the experiences of our ancestors are passed down to us in the form of our emotional response to change, changes in our body, changes in our environment. And most people just don't have any deep understanding of how, how our mind actually is operating on the basis of a program that's millions of years old. So when we experience stress, we don't understand it as being a very normal response. And so we look for relief. And the relief we look for is dopamine. We can have a period of stress in our life, but if we engage in some scotch therapy, right, alcohol, suddenly we replace the stress and the suffering we're going through with temporary pleasure. The but problem with that, explain, explain to the people who are watching, some of whom may be 12 year old kids who aren't drinking <laughs> scotch, I hope. Right. Because as, as we all know, there's lots of kids who are experiencing a new type of stress and some of it's inflicted by their parents' frustration. Right. But what is dopamine? Yeah. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the brain that makes you feel good. And so this is a very powerful motivator in not just in humans, but in the animal kingdom. The dopamine reward pathway originated somewhere between 300 and 330 million years ago. And the reason it was such a potent survival mechanism is because it enabled the earliest animals to distinguish between low survival value foods versus high survival value foods. If you came across sugar or fat or salt, Yes, that, that will help you survive, but it had more calorie density than most of the food that was available. So animals that got a pleasure reward from eating certain nutrients ended up hunting and gathering and looking for more of those. The problem is, is that in modern society, we have all of these substances that have nothing to do with survival. And so alcohol, as far as I know, is not part of the uh, macronutrient requirement for human beings, but it releases dopamine. Or so if we test your mind, we'd have a drink, we feel great temporarily, the external stress doesn't go away, the alcohol wears off and we feel worse than we did before. And, and that's probably true in fairness, if we think of kids in the form of screen time. Yeah, absolutely. And there's lots of behaviors. It's not just alcohol and sugar and food. It's gaming, over, it's overworking. It might be shopping when you don't need something, um, obsessing with things. So there are all these behaviors. People are frantic. Everyone wants to reduce suffering. Everyone wants to increase happiness. But we're looking for these solutions outside of our mind. In our, in, in, in our environment and not inside our mind. You know, when you and I first engaged um, and we talked about my mind, which was my wife's frustration, of course, but is I would wake, I would wake up in the middle of the night and the minute I was awoke, I mean, I could get six hours sleep. I'd wake up at 4 a.m. The minute I woke up, my brain started working sure. and I couldn't shut it down. And, 
and 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 all of that did was feed upon itself with me being tired in the day and getting highly frustrated. And so, what are some of the things that we can think about to create resilience in this way? Well, I think that resilience, certainly from my experience in my personal life, and also my experience working with many many clients, is that resilience is the ability to observe, if this is your conscious mind or your true self, if this is your ancestral mind, it's the ability to observe your ancestral mind doing something, but not engaging it, and then engaging in some practice to transform that agitated, confused, disturbed state of mind into a calm and clear and stable state. It's, it, it's essentially training your mind, the conscious, experiencing directing consciousness of your mind to change your mental state directly. Now that sounds hocus pocus. It sounds a little bit out there, but it's actually a very simple technique. I taught my kids how to practice mindfulness when they were three years old. And what we did is we sat in a hot tub in the backyard and I taught them to follow their breath. And what happened is they learned that when they focused on the breath and not on discursive thoughts, not on the past, not on the future, their body naturally descended into a state of relaxation. But, and but as I, they got good at this, they continued to practice this. And this is the key to mindfulness is it's not a new kind of thought that you, that you insert into your conscious stream. It's actually a way of observing your mind without engaging it and watching the natural state spooling down. So now, and we, as I talked about before a moment ago, that you know, there's people talking about this COVID divorce, which says that when stress hurt happened to me before, you know, and, and you and I went through the process of learning meditation, and, and in fairness to everyone, I come from a spiritual background, so I, I applied some of that spiritual principles, whether it's scripture or prayer, in the process, but in context of that, we're seeing these, these relationships breaking down because of this, you use the word future, this uncertainty that nobody can actually get their hands on and figure out. And so how well, do we- Not just uncertainty, it's also all the unfinished business in the relationship. And now you don't get a break. So you're spending time with each other and getting into each other's uh, space. You know, um, mindfulness is the foundation of a conscious co-committed an intimate relationship. And, and maybe one way I can demonstrate this is to show you the difference between an argument between two people and what happens when one of those two people actually has learned the skill. You wanna see this? Okay, well, okay. okay. <laughs> it, 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 just takes, it just takes a second. Okay, okay. okay. So this is an argument between two people. A, 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 A. No, B, B, B. No, A, A, A. No, B, B, B. No, A, no, B. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Now, I'm sure you've never had one of those. No, no, and a scotch in and the middle. The theoretically, in other relationships, that's an argument. So how can you have a conversation with someone that you disagree with without being disagreeable? It's simple. Watch. A, 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 A. Oh, A, A, A? Yeah, A, 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 A. Oh, A, 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 A. Must be pretty hard for you. Yeah, it really is. Do you get that I've heard you? Yeah, you really listened to me for once. <laughs> what about B, B, B? So the key is most people don't remember what they argued about because it's not the content, it's the process. And if you're agitated, your ability to receive someone else's thoughts and feelings and their problems is very limited. So mindfulness, when it comes to relationships, begins with yourself. It's to learn how to recognize and transform your agitated, confused, and disturbed states of mind into calm, clear, and stable states. And then to be able to listen mindfully and to speak mindfully without that degenerating into an argument. Now, 
I didn't learn that from my parents, did you? I saw wonderful examples in my parents, to be honest. So, I, so, I, I, they, so they, fair they, enough. They, most they people, wonderful, wonderful. most of us have not learned this from our parents, our family of origin, our, you know, our childhood, our schools, etc. But those skills, the intrapersonal skill of taking care of your mind and your body, and the interpersonal skills between each other, this is what's what we've really lost in terms of our culture and in terms of our intelligence, our emotional intelligence as a society. Well, I mean, one might almost say it's getting dangerous. Sure it is. You know, what happens is, remember, the human ancestral mind wants to know at all costs, including the truth. And this is a very difficult concept for us to really appreciate. So in the absence of evidence or experience or skill, the human ancestral mind spontaneously generates dramatic fiction, conspiracy theory. How could Trump possibly have lost the election? It must be therefore fake. That's not true, but it satisfies the need to know, even if the knowledge is completely fraudulent. Otherwise, the mind is stressed out. And it's a very, very dangerous, slippery slope into the kind of cacophony, the kind of curse of Babel, if you want to use, uh, you know, uh, you know, religious terms, that that actually destroys the fabric and foundation of of, uh, of a modern civilization. And we're seeing that now. So let's talk a little bit about that in the context for a moment of the third subject that I mentioned. You know, this issue of loneliness. Uh, there's right. so many of our staff. Who are, who are single and maybe at home, or they're, as you described, they, they're a, a small or young family and, and they've been constrained. And there's this new sense of togetherness, but also a sense of loneliness. And so how, how is it that we cope with some of those? Cause it, it, it's a generator of, of depression, which leads to stress. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is, is that we have to recognize that the solution to loneliness, first and foremost, is to recognize that your mind, your nature as a human being is we're social. We wanna be part of a family. We wanna be part of a tribe because if we're not, it poses an existential threat. You know, Frank Sinatra was wrong. When he sang, I did it my way, he was talking about ideology, but human beings don't do it as individuals. We always do it as family, tribal, organizational units. And so when we find ourselves in a situation where we cannot have social intercourse and dialogue, we have to first of all recognize that that suffering is completely normal. And even though that doesn't sound very therapeutic, once you normalize suffering and you begin to realize, okay, this is a normal part of my mental state then you can begin through mindfulness to reduce that sense of angst. What is really damaging is when you allow your ancestral mind to begin ruminating about the loneliness and you begin to generate all kinds of, of dramatic fiction that actually makes it worse, or you begin to engage in behavior that temporarily makes you feel better, but actually can create more harm. So, you know, so, so the key here for loneliness is, first of all, is to accept, okay, this is part of the price we're paying right now through this pandemic. And my reaction isn't an overreaction. It's a normal response to being isolated from the tribe, so to speak. It, it is a difficult, I mean, it's just so difficult. So let's talk a little bit about, I'm going to step back. You talked about the things that we choose to do to generate dopamine. Uh, I, it seems like whether it's the scotch or whether it's the cigarettes or whether it's watching TV or spending all the time gambling or online, whatever it is, talk about some healthy things that right. generate dopamine. Well, I think the first thing for sure is exercise. And even though our gyms may be closed and maybe we don't have you know, access to any equipment or it's, you know, it's too cold outside to go on our trampoline. We've got to get exercise. We've got to get outside. We've got to get into a natural environment and we need to spend time away from four walls and a ceiling, away from electronic gadgets. And we need to do some forest bathing. 
You know, Dr. Hinohara, very famous Japanese physician, one of my heroes, he died at 105 years old. And he was still working six weeks before he died. And mm -hmm. taking appointments five years in advance. Talk about an optimist. You want to have an appointment <laughs> with a doctor who's going to be 110 when you see him. That's him. And he developed forest bathing. So what he did is he took executives in Tokyo who had high blood pressure and he randomized them to drug or forest therapy. One hour silent walking in a park three times a week. Well, guess what? Blood pressure went down. So exercise, sleep, getting seven to nine hours of sleep. Sleep is the only time that your brain engages in DNA repair. So stop, if you want stop, to recover. Stop, stop. Yeah. you got that, that, That's a little bit above my pay grade. So to say that again. So the only time that your brain is engaged in actually repairing itself, DNA repair is when you're sleeping. During so the day, there's back, too much energy that is that is that is manifesting in thinking processes that's why sleep is so essential sleep deprivation beyond three days can actually be fatal so okay so let's go back to my question when i first saw you you know waking up and your mind just goes right and, and all of a sudden you know that seven to nine hours is now three and a half to four and i have the stupidity of saying oh i'm fine yeah how do I address that in the middle of the night? And it's not well, going to be to wake my well, First wife. of all, in the middle of the night, when you wake up, it's too late. You have to start with that one or two hours before you go to bed. You need to bring the temperature down in the room you're going to sleep. You need to avoid exposure to electronic things with blue light that stimulate your brain to suppress the production release of melatonin. In other words, you need an evening ritual that does not engage your ancestral mind's thinking processes, whether it's music or art or literature or playing a game or doing something you know, that is not too activated. And then as you sleep during the night, when you wake up, you can get up, you can go to the bathroom, you can come back, you can put one or two drops of lavender oil onto your pillow, you can close your eyes, and you can focus on the aroma of the lavender as you breathe in and as you breathe out and change your focus on your mind taking you for the ride and you're saying, no, right now I'm sleeping, so I will deal with you tomorrow. Focus on the breath and guess what? You will gradually get back to, to sleep. So there are many ways that you can improve your sleep hygiene, but the first one is to recognize that you're waking up at three, four, five in the morning because that's what you've trained your mind to do during the day, thinking, 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 thinking. Well, if you don't take your hands off the steering wheel, you don't take your foot off the gas, that's what your brain's going to do. You have to train your mind to go down a few notches so that you can actually have a good night's sleep. So a good night's sleep starts one or two hours before. It takes about two or three weeks to change your sleep hygiene. So go back and just really quickly, just let's be practical, share <laughs> just very simply what you think happens post seven o'clock. Uh, at night? Yeah. Well, have you ever been camping? Yeah, uh, not, not a lot. I, I'm, I'm a glamp, glamper or whatever they call it. So, so many, many, many years ago, when I was a young university student, I worked as a mountain guide out West. And I taught young, young men. So, you know, all in their early teens, 13, 14, 15. And they were all city kids, right? They all watched TV. And we would go for two weeks in the bush. And well, what happened is at the end of the day, when the camp was set up and we finished eating, we had a campfire. And we would talk and we would share stories, et cetera. And then around nine o'clock, these kids all started to nod off and they went to bed <laughs> because there was no TV, there was no radio. Certainly back then there were no cell phones and their body naturally began to spool down. And guess when these kids would wake up? With the sun. How many teenagers do you know that wake up with the sun? except maybe at the crack of noon. So what <laughs> happened is 
their mind completely started to resonate with this natural environment. So the key is, is to try to recapitulate that. Dark, cool, quiet at nighttime. And then in the morning when you get up, really bright light. Because that's what your body needs. It needs the sun, the diurnal rhythm of the sun. We are hardwired to that. And that's probably in a nutshell kind of the principle here. Hmm. Amazing. Well, we have lots of parents here with young kids. We have lots of parents who have experienced new forms of stress and, in, and impatience. Right. And we have lots of young kids um, who, who are probably struggling with whether it's school, whether it's attention, whether it's and devices and all of those things. How do you advise a parent with regards to managing that circumstance and their child without, you know, I mean, this isn't easy. I mean, I think, I think it goes right back to what I said at the beginning. If you want a conscious, co-committed, loving relationship with your partner, and you want the same with your children, you have to start with yourself. It's not selfishness. Right? It, it's all about taking care of your mind and your body, first and foremost, making sure that you're getting enough rest. And again, the, the, the invitation here is five or 10 minutes of mindfulness is the minimum effective dose that has been shown in clinical studies to have a measurable and meaningful effect on stress. Uh, studies, for example, using functional MRI scanning shows that after eight weeks, the chemistry and the structure of the human brain begins to show changes as a result of the practice of mindfulness. So this is the first thing is take care of yourself, carve out two or three weeks to really start to learn how to take care of your mind. And then learn how to listen and speak mindfully to your family. Because what happens is if you're upset, if you have a short fuse, nothing good ever comes out of your mouth. So if you have a long fuse, and if you are uh, listening very carefully to hear first what's going on in that person's life, and you're taking it and giving it and checking with that person, you're gonna be a lot more fluid and a lot more creative with respect to how you respond. Hmm. So I would love I would love to spend hours on just that, but that in a nutshell is the essence. Take care of yourself first, listen mindfully, speak mindfully, try to avoid conflict, especially when you're tired or hungry or 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 sleep deprived. And let's go down that one level to young kids. So how do you eat? Let's say you've got the parents taking care of themselves and you're right. They come with a different attitude. Their patient's level is longer. Their, their tone is better, but, but they still have a child who's going through transition, whether it's at school, whether it's an online school, all of those things that, that, that as a parent, it's, you can't get inside that child's mind to say, just, I'm going to fix you. H how do you, how do well, you, well, first that? of all, uh, kids don't need to be fixed. They need no. to be heard. And I really think that you need to demonstrate. Children will do what you do, not what you say. And, and the way into a child's mind and into their heart is first, time is quality. You, you can't be rushed, especially with younger children. And I think the key is to slow everything down, to eliminate all of the distractions and just spend time monitoring your own mental state spending time with that child, you know, depending on what they're experiencing, you know, and being able to reflect what they're going through and being very accepting of what they're going through. And it's amazing how children will respond to someone who's just present with them. Mm, amazing. So we're, we're getting close to the time when I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about uh, cognitive and, and breathing the therapy that you're referring yeah. to. And, and maybe in a moment, we'll even, we'll, yeah. we'll, 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 so first give us an introduction to that. And then we'll, we'll invite everybody to jump in. So um, what, what's your sense there? So, so I think the first thing to recognize is that at any given moment of time, you have many things that you can focus your attention on. You can allow yourself to dwell in the past and think about how bad yesterday was, or last week, or last year. Or like, next week, or next week, 
or you can focus on the future. You know, Lao Tzu in The Art of War said, if you allow your mind to dwell in the past, you will experience regret. If you allow your mind to dwell in the future, you will experience anxiety. Amazing. But if you train your mind to dwell in the present moment, you will experience peace. And that's the key. Your consciousness can move, but most people haven't trained that. So when some shiny new car shows up, bang. <laughs> when you think about a problem in the past, right? Bang, your mind is there. So this skill in mindfulness is to decide, okay, I'm going to focus my attention for five minutes on the breath, the cool inhalation, the warm exhalation. Now, how long do you suppose most people can stay focused on the breath? Well, I remember the first time you did it with me, I think I was 10 seconds or 15. Right. Now, you know, the key here is to understand that that's completely normal. When you go into a gym, if you've never been in a gym before, if you've never exercised before, you're not going to be able to do very much on that first day. But with practice, you get better and better and better at focusing. So the main reason why mindfulness is so difficult and why the way that it should be taught should be very easy is because it's mind-numbingly boring. When you focus on the breath, there are just so many other things that I would rather be doing. And so you immediately start to have this tension between the intention, the breath, and the usual state of your mind, which is it's all over the place. But what happens is, as you gain some skill, and you can do it in the first session, when you focus, everything else starts to settle. And then when you finish, wow, I feel great. How did that happen? Because your body naturally wants to be at a state of peace. Your mind naturally wants to have inner peace. It's not something that you have to acquire from outside your mind. It's our natural state, but we're not familiar with it because we don't know how to get there anymore. Well, are you open to an idea of, of trying a, a breathing based meditation with the entire team? And if, if you're I think interested- it would be great. Um, and, team, and if you're interested, turn your camera on. So at least Randy knows that he's got a group that he's working with and he can give us some instruction. And so, uh, if you're so interested, turn your cameras here's the on. Instruction. What what I'd like you to do is I'm just going to show you what I'm going to do, okay? And that is at the beginning of this meditation, I'm going to ring a little bell. It sounds like this. Now, you notice that I spent a long time with that bell. <laughs> Did you notice something happening to your mind? Did your mind not want to get on to the next comment? Of course. So this is the skill. So what I'd like you to do, if you can, is to find a place to sit. If you can, you can do this standing up, but you'll need to close your eyes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a five-minute exercise. And, um, and then afterwards, we'll have a chat about what your experience was, all right? Now, I'm actually going to join you for this meditation. Whenever you hear the bell, it means, where is my mind right now? Is it on the breath? Or has my mind wandered off somewhere else? And so if the mind has wandered somewhere else, bring your attention back to the breath until you hear the next bell. And we'll do that for about five minutes. And at the end of that, I will invite you to open your eyes and we can have a chat about this, okay? So the first thing you need to do is you need to find the object. So if you breathe through your nose right now, can you feel a slightly cool sensation just on the inside of your nose? Just nod your head if you can feel that. Now, when you breathe out, 
can you notice that there's a change in the temperature of the breath as you breathe out through your nose? Nod your head if you notice that. So that is the object. It's very simple. It's very boring. And all you do is you focus on the cool inhalation and the warm exhalation. And we'll do that in one minute intervals. At the end of one minute, you're gonna hear the bell and it's just gonna remind you to come back to the breath in case you've gone on and wondered what you're gonna to have to eat after this meditation. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to join you. So please close your eyes and let the momentum of your life completely rest. Let go of the past and the future. Give yourself permission just to enjoy five minutes of inner peace. Notice the space in the room where you're sitting. Notice the sensation of your body in the chair. And then become aware of the breath as you breathe in and out through your nose. The cool inhalation and the warm exhalation. If it helps you, you can think the word in during the in-breath and out during the out-breath. And when you notice that your mind has wandered, gently bring your attention back to the breath, just like that.
Now keeping your eyes closed for just a little while longer, just put the thought or the intention in your mind. I will stay in touch with this calm, clear and stable state of mind that I've produced for as long as I can after I open my eyes. And whenever I notice an agitated, confused or disturbed state of mind arising, no matter what the situation, I will practice taking one or two conscious breaths in and out and restore my mind to this calm, clear and stable state before I think or say or do anything next. Just hold that intention in your mind for a few moments. Let yourself come out of meditation very gradually and smoothly, trying not to rush. Let your eyes open when they're ready to open. And just check to see how your mind and your body are feeling now. And what that feels like. And I think it would be helpful maybe we have a conversation about this because this is the essence of the practice of mindfulness, is to recognize the changes that we experience when we practice like this. Because listen to this, nothing has changed outside your mind. All the problems you thought you had are still there. All of the challenges are still there. The only change that you experienced right now was a change in your mental state. And that's the skill that you're gonna to want to cultivate. So I'm interested to know what you experienced. And I guess, Stephen, if that's all right with you, maybe- yeah, some Absolutely, I wanna I want focus on one word you used early in the meditation for the benefit of a, you used the word permission. Yes. Isn't it, isn't it a strange, I mean, when you used the word and I heard it, it was like, I actually had to give myself permission. Yeah. Talk to us just really quickly about that and then I'll open it up. I mean, psychodynamically, um, we are social creatures. So we're constantly adjusting our behavior and our actions according to our parents, our family, our siblings, our environment, you know, our workplace. And so when it comes to actually experiencing, um, you know, uh, peace, it's almost like we have to say, okay, the next few minutes, I'm going to actually give my mind and my body something really compassionate and loving. And for some people, they actually need to give themselves permission to do that. Mm. So it's really an invitation to be open to the experience and just to take really good care of yourself, even if it's just for 10 minutes. Mm. Great. I can't see everybody because I, I've got a screen that really just shows a, a few of you because I've got a small screen. So if you do have a question or a comment, unmic yourself and speak up. If we have a conflict, we'll try and do our best to hear you both. They're usually not shy, Randy. <laughs> but they're so quiet now. <laughs> Hi, Steve. I've got a question um, to okay. kind of go off of. Now, I've, I've watched some of your um, podcasts before, and you recommend this as part of a morning ritual um, in addition to, um, um, I think it was an intense workout, a 15-minute um, physical workout. And is it is it more beneficial to wake up and then go into the physical workout and then into the breathing exercises? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great question. So there is something that I call TBM, which is called training the body and mind. So if you begin your morning after you wake up and go to the bathroom and put on your gear with a workout, and it doesn't have to be long, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes of some workout, that increases blood flow to the brain and raises brain serotonin levels very close to the same level you would expect with an antidepressant medication. So at that point in time, your body and your mind is wide awake. And if you go straight into the showers, you're still sweating. 
So if you just dry yourself off and you sit and then meditate, that is the best time to meditate because now your body is awake, your mind is awake, your body is feeling supple and your concentration will be really brilliant. Then you do your shower, then you have your morning, whatever you do in the morning and off to work you go. The morning then becomes a really important part of your daily ritual. It's like a bookend. It's for you. And when do people, when do people ask and have demands of you? Five, six in the morning or five, six in the afternoon? So that's the time that you can have for yourself. And then in the evening, you do a recovery ritual and in between you work. So having a morning ritual, you're, you're three times more likely to be exercising and meditating a year from now than if you do it any time, any other time of the day. That was great, thanks. Um, and then so, uh, and I like how you actually have it as bookends. So it's kind of a warm up before you do your workout and then a cool off, but your warm up is actually your morning ritual. Your work is your full time workout and then your cool down is your just your evening ritual. So uh, I like how you kind of put that all together. Thanks. Thanks for answering the question. Thank you. I've, I've done this from time to time and, and always just feel incredible when I do it. Um, but I can't seem to find the rhythm to, to really get into it, uh, you know, on my own. Yeah, and I just yeah. wondered if you had any pointers for that. I've, I've asked this question before of others and I just can't, I can't seem to stick with it, but it's strange that I can't because it just feels so good. I think that it's partly because of the culture you know, meditation is not part of our culture. You know, we can't, we can't remember childhood experiences where our parents taught us mindfulness because those are just odd parents and we don't, it's not part, it's not supported. So I would say that the, that the first real key is to recognize your agency. Most of you grossly underestimate your latent mastery. You, you don't realize just how much agency you have over your mental state. So if you make a connection with meditation and it is beneficial to you, then the effort is about three weeks. You have to more or less establish a morning ritual and either invite someone who you live, work or play with to join you, or if there's somebody at home to ask them to please support you in your practice. So you start off a morning ritual, takes about three weeks. And then what happens is when you stop for whatever reason, you miss it. If you do it for just a few days, it's a novelty, you're not gonna miss it. So I think the effort is that first three weeks. And then the second thing is that you need to find other people who are interested in meditation. You know, like for example, tonight I meditated with you and I received just as much benefit as you did. So it's not like, you know, it was hard for me to do this. This was great for me. So thank you for meditating with me today. Mm. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I've got a, I've got a quick question, Randy, about uh, the combination of nutrition. I know that you mentioned exercise, um, but, uh, and, and how that blood flow acted positively um, on the ability to, uh, to kind of decompress. Um, would, would having something like a vasodilator, like a, even a cherry juice or just cherries, something like that, would that be beneficial if you don't have time to work out? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's, there's all sorts of challenges that you and me and everyone has in terms of their daily rituals. And so I would say that, um, that there isn't really a nutritional substitute for this. I mean, cherry juice has been shown to increase, um, you know, um, uh, N uh, uh, nicotinamide, riboside, and some NAD, um, which are energy molecules in the brain, and it's a very potent anti-inflammatory. But there's a difference between allowing a nutrient to produce a passive effect on your brain versus training your conscious self to learn a skill. The, the, the outcome is quite a bit different when you're actually practicing, focusing your attention 
And then over the course of weeks, gaining more and more skill. Um, and the effect there is a cognitive one as well as a physiological one separate, uh, you know, separately. Um, so yes, there are some nutrients that are beneficial for the brain. There are a lot that are harmful to the brain. Um, but I don't think that, you know, if you, if you don't have enough time, you know, five minutes, five minutes is the ask. So at some point you have to decide, well, how much time do I have for my mental health? And if, if five minutes seems too much, then, you know, unfortunately, it's unlikely you'll initiate a meditation practice. Randy, what a great evening. I'm cognizant of our time. I, I committed and asked you for one hour, and it's been a wonderful hour. Um, on behalf of our whole organization, I want to thank you. You know, we are all about families and young kids. And so in, in tribute of your participation with us tonight, we're going to make a charitable donation in each of the countries that we function and operate for children's mental health, if that's okay with you. And, and um, I know that you and I have had conversations where, where we've talked about the importance of this continuing. So I want to commit to our staff that this is an important part of who you are with our organization. And so whether, if you have a health plan that provides you with this coverage, please utilize it. And if you don't, make sure you come to us so we can. And Randy and I have even discussed whether or not we try a non-Facebook Live where we, we, we engage within the community of Spring Free to further this discussion. And if we do that, I'm, I know that many of you will want to join us. Randy Knipping, as always, thank you. You've had uh, a tremendous insight on all of us tonight. And for thank all you of very your- Thank yeah. I enjoyed being in all of your homes this evening. Thank you very much. Um, enjoy the fullness and richness of every moment of your precious human life. Thank you, Randy. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody. For those of you watching on Facebook Live, we have enjoyed having you. Special call out to Lynette McFarland. It's her birthday today. Have a great night.